Great. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to the SACOG Land Use and Natural Resource Committee meeting today for Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. Do we have some housekeeping items, Robert? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Uh, as you just heard, this meeting is being recorded and streamed over the internet. For members of the public, we accept and encourage public comment and have provided options that are listed at the top of this meeting agenda. For our committee members, thank you for joining us today. Please mute your devices when you're not speaking and use the raise hand feature in Zoom should you wish to comment. Uh, also, Chair Bradford, there is a slight change to the meeting agenda due to uh, staff time constraints. We're going to be presenting item five uh, before item four. So the agenda will go as item one, two, three, five, four, and then item six to, to finish it out. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start off this morning with the, or I guess this afternoon, with uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Director Harris, will you lead that, please? Absolutely. I'll please salute and pledge. I pledge of allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which stand one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great, thank you. Next up is roll call. Okay, uh, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your presence. Uh, Director Bullahan. Absent. Frost. Oh, I do see. Okay, for the record, Director Frost is here. Uh, Gore. Absent. Harris. Uh, here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Kennedy, absent. Nicely. Here. Kozlowski. Here. West. Here. Vice Chair Baines. Present. Vice Chair Lozano. Absent. And Chair Bradford. Here. We do have a quorum. Great. Thank you. Next up is public communications. Um, so. There's no open public comment at this time, but there is a public comment for item three when we do get to item three. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Then we'll move on to the consent agenda. So are there any board comments or questions or anyone want to pull anything from the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, is there any public comment on the consent agenda? Uh, there's no public comment. Okay, great. So uh, we'll entertain a motion for that. West, move to approve. Second by Baines. Okay. Great. Thank you. And I believe we have to do roll call vote, correct? Yes, we do. Uh, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Bullahan? Absent. Frost? Aye. Gore? Absent. Harris? Yes. Kennedy? Absent. Nicely? Yes. Kozlowski? Yes. West? Aye. Yes. Vice Chair Baines? Aye. Vice Chair Lozano? Aye. And Chair Bradford? Aye. Motion carries. Great. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to item three under action. Green means go. Funding recommendations, planning, and capital categories. Garrett? Well, yeah. Good afternoon. Thanks, Chair. Really excited to be here on behalf of the larger Green Means Go team at SACOG to present a major milestone in the program. And as you mentioned, it's for a funding recommendation for 31.3 million in our Green Means Go program. Before we get into that funding recommendation, I did want to take a step back. I know you all are tracking a lot of initiatives and remind ourselves what we mean by Green Means Go. It's our newest program at SACOG. It's a pilot program here at SACOG. And again, it's, it's really responding to a, a key need in our region. There's a lot of aspirations and, and goals and objectives around, around accelerating infill in our existing communities, revitalizing those existing communities. We see those goals at the state level. We see them in our own regional long range plan. We see them also you know, captured at the local level. But despite that alignment and sort of policy perspective, there's key challenges in, in um, accelerating infill, especially in an inland region like ourselves. And so really what Green Means Go is about is, is thinking about infill and, as a, and sort of the needs in the Sacramento region and, and how we can go about accelerating um, infill across green zones throughout the region and green zones are the areas that your own cities and counties have nominated as areas that have capacity for more infill housing and also have low um, vehicle miles traveled. So we've been working hard in Green Means Go. 
Uh, we've been in a lot of work around technical assistance. We've just wrapped up a couple of activities with a great partnership with the Urban Land Institute, including activities in Sacramento County and Folsom, Yuba City and Marysville. We're, we're compiling best practice, but, but the main um, activity in Green Means Go has been this, this funding program. And, and a, a really important emphasize, point to emphasize is this funding, this 31.3 million that you'll be considering today is brand new funding to the region, but it's also this one-time plan funding. It's a pilot program that your, your colleagues on the transportation committee this morning considered or heard of some funding recommendations and a transportation program, the active transportation program, that program is a recurring program and that every several years there's a, there's a, there's a round in that transportation program. For Green Means Go, we have this one-time funding. So we're really excited about um, you know, moving forward with um, the staff recommendation, but I do wanna call attention to, um, this is the inaugural Green Means Go funding. We'll hope there'll be subsequent Green Means Go funding, but, but this is the, the funding um, available to us at this point in time. One other point, just in terms of, of background, it will become important at the, at the end of my staff presentation is, we call this Green Means Go here in the Sacramento region. But we do nest within this broader state program, which is called REAP2. The acronym is not important. The important point is uh, these are state funds that um, have come to SACOG that we are now making a recommendation to the board. So there are things that we need to align with in that state program. I'll talk about that at the end. So all to say, right, um, this one-time funding coming to the region, we really benefit and have the luxury of um, a head start on this. We've had our Green Means Go program for several years now. We've had extensive outreach with the cities and counties with the building community, development community, housing community, community groups, all thinking about what are some of the challenges to infill in our region. And so we, we really honed in through this funding program around two of those key challenges, just the physical infrastructure need for these infill communities. The existing communities often have outdated infrastructure that can't serve the, the new housing coming in. And there's also work that needs to be done on the planning side to, to get these corridors ready for, for um, future um, capital investment. So you'll see, right, the, the two categories you're considering today, there's the planning category, and then there's a the capital, i.e. infrastructure category. We followed a, a process back in 2022 that the Lunar Committee oversaw of, of adopting guidelines, right? We have 31.3 million in funding. The guidelines lay out what are the criteria and what's the process. It was, it was a great public process, a lot of comments, and the board did it, adopt those guidelines back in 2022. And so then we, we um, developed the applications and we did what we call a call for projects, basically asking for applications to come in. A couple points to emphasize on the application period. We had a, it's called a pre-application consult or the opportunity for any sponsor or a project proponent to sit down with us, Green Means Go staff to talk through those projects. And we were able to accommodate any requests that came in. We were able to weigh in on there's several different categories, what seemed to be the most promising category, and also we on um, does this align with the objective the Green Means Go. Um, we also worked to get together some just consistent data. So all the projects that came in, we're able to use our data tools as one starting point to just give some indicators about their project. So no surprise, right? We know the need in this region for, for more housing. The program came in, in oversubscribed. As a reminder, Back in November, you acted on the very first part of Green Means Go, what's called early activation. That was 3.2 million. That was also oversubscribed. This is the, the much larger portion of it, the remaining 31.3 in planning and capital, also oversubscribed. And of course, we know through those conversations that this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the, the need in the region. Um, you know, it's an oversubscribed pro program. We talk in the staff item, in particular, attachment B, about the working group review. We, we, we followed our, our, our uh, process that we've honed through various transportation rounds, right? We convened a, a professional working group. First, we asked them to identify any potential conflicts of interest. Then we asked them to independently look at every single application based on those criteria they were established in the program guidelines, and finally to come together and deliberate. Um, you know, of course, we understand that the disappointment um, that not all projects were able to move you know, forward in a staff recommendation. It is, it is an oversubscribed program. You'll hear Robert mentioned it. We did receive a public comment on this item, so you'll you'll um, a letter, um, you know, expressing their disappointment and and not being part of the staff recommendations. Of course, we understand that. I want to call attention to that to that um, letter that was received. So let me move now. That was sort of all process and background. Let me move now to just the staff recommendation itself. What you would be, um, if you so um, desire to move this forward, what you'd be moving forward to the SACOG board, right? The first is uh, rec or recommending the revised budget. I mentioned there's a planning category and there's a capital category. 
at the onset, we set ranges for those two categories. The range for planning was 5 million. Our staff recommendation is 4.8 million given the applications received. So a little bit below that initial target we had set. So we'd ask the board to adopt that revised funding level. The second part of the action is just for the board to um, endorse the, the funding awards themselves. The third would be to, to authorize James, our executive director, to be to you know enter into contracts so we'll be able to move forward on these important projects. And then the fourth part, sorry, this you know multi-step uh, recommendation would be uh, there's one partial award that you see in, out of out of this between the planning and capital categories. The the last part of it would be should there be any um, uh, leftover um, funds in the program? We don't expect any. This fully expends the funding available, but should any project that um, is recommended for funding been, be unable to, to move forward with that project. The first use of those funds would be for that partially um, funded project, the Highway 49 project in Placer. So again, I just wanted to call out the individual elements of the staff recommendation. The main one is endorsing the funding recommendation with those other components to it. Last part of the staff report, I just wanted to make sure that this committee was tracking. I mentioned up front, Green Means Go nests within this larger state program. We do need to have the state and, and um, specifically the California Department of Housing and Community Development or HCD, we do need them to approve our Green Means Go methodology. We are, we're very close to getting that approval. We do not have it yet. Uh, a couple updates based on when, since the staff item was um, released last week, we've been in, in constant conversation this week with our partners at HCD. Like I said, we're, we're really close. We do anticipate by the time this item is heard by the full state hog board to have that um, uh, adoption by our state partners, but um, you know there's an off chance that it would not. If that's the case, uh, we could. There's a couple options for the state hog board to consider, but um, you know these awards cannot be finalized until we do have that that um, adoption by HCD. But we we think we're very close, and just in context, we most likely will be the first region, the state hog region of any region in the state, to get that adoption. I think it's a testament to to the work that's been done um, in the build up to Green Means Go. I, a, lot of, a lot of the other regions are still trying to piece it together. I think we've really positioned ourselves to, dem to demonstrate to the state you know, the need in our region also, you know, we're ready to move forward on these important projects. So again, all the way a background of staff recommendation in front of you for the funding awards. I walked through the process. I walked through the, the one nuance of, we're still waiting for that final approval from the state, but we do think we'll have it soon. Yeah, yeah, that concludes my staff presentation. Of course, let me know what questions you have. Great. Thank you, Garrett. Any uh, questions or comments from directors? Okay. Seeing none, Robert, do we have some public comment? Yes, Chair Bradford, we received a public comment from Clifton Taylor, president of Taylor Builders. Uh, for the record, the letter received has been distributed to the committee members and it is posted on our website under handout number one. Okay. I, it does appear we might have a member of the public with their hand up as well. Yes, it uh, looks like we have Nick Avidis. Uh, give me one moment to bring them in. Okay, Nick, uh, you are unmuted and you have three minutes to make a comment. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Chair Bradford. Nick Avidis with the Law Offices of Avidis and Coochie. On behalf of Taylor Builders, you've obviously had a chance to review the letter that was submitted um, by Taylor Builders. I just want to make a, a few comments, uh, adding some color to that. First off, I want to thank staff. Uh, Garrett and uh, Greg Chu have been uh, very accessible and, you know, we've worked um, closely with them to answer our questions. We, as he mentioned, are extremely disappointed that our project wasn't selected. <laughs> the project and its location uh, along an existing light rail line next to a um, literally a light rail station to nowhere. Uh, we've been working very closely with RT and our project sponsor, the city of Sacramento, obviously to bring more investment uh, to an area that's been traditionally a low investment area um, and accelerating the development of affordable housing uh, and uh, improving uh, flooding and uh, uh, stormwater quality runoff from existing uh, neighborhoods, including the Detroit community and in the city of Sacramento. Uh, that being said, uh, we understand that the, this, this um, funding mechanism is oversubscribed. I think one of our, um, I would say one of the suggestions we have in the future um, is uh, really to engage in a, a more transparent process as it relates to the scoring criteria um, through our various discussions and, and feedback. It's still hard to gauge, you know, where exactly, um, which, which items were weighed more heavily and how. 
uh, I think uh, a transparent um, point scoring system uh, would be more helpful to understand where a project like ours falls in the rating category. Um, so with that said, um, appreciate the time this morning and thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abdus. Any additional public comment, Robert? Uh, I'm seeing no other public comment for this item. Okay, with that, we will bring it back to the board. Um, seeing no additional board comment or question at this time, uh, we'll entertain a motion. Is there a motion from the a director to? Yeah, this is West, move to approve. Second, Frost. Okay. I make sure the address works. Uh, roll call vote, please. All right, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Bulahan. Um, aye. Frost. Aye. Harris. Yes. Kennedy. Uh, absent. Nicely. Yes. Kozlowski. Yes. West. Yes. Vice Chair Baines. Uh, Vice Chair Baines, if you can indicate your vote. Looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Uh, Vice Chair Lozano? Aye. Uh, Chair Bradford? Aye. And I, I missed Chair Gore, or sorry, uh, Director Gore. Director Gore, absent. Motion carries. Great, thank you. Next, we will move. Chair Bradford, do you mind if I just, uh, just want to make a quick comment? Um, and look, we, we appreciate um, Project applicants speaking up, and and you know we we wish we had more funding available, right? And I just want to, especially for the new board members, I want to remind you of the action you just took for Green Mango. You know, Garrett did a great job of setting that up, but three years ago there was not going to be any funding whatsoever. And in 2019, to remind you all, this program was conceived because we were having a very hard time reaching our greenhouse gas reduction target. A big way in which we're going to reach our greenhouse gas reduction target is through more uh, development in existing areas, uh, small towns, cities, suburbs, commercial corridors. We went out, all of many of you spent a lot of time uh, to actually uh, advocate and secure funding. Right? We got 31 million. Senator Penn was able to actually provide that extra funding for the early activation. We know it's a drop in the bucket. So you just took an action on 31 plus million. The need at least in the region is probably over half a billion. And that's gonna climb as we do the planning. A lot of the, uh, the planning grants that uh, Garrett mentioned that are in your packet, I think are gonna uncover the very real need of water, sewer and utility upgrades. So I guess my, um, my just reminder, my plea to all of you is we, you made this happen. <laughs> This is a homegrown, creative, bottom-up solution here in the Sacramento region, and we got to keep going. We have to go find more funding at the state level, the federal level, and that is exactly what we're going to continue to try to do. So uh, we wish we had more money, <laughs> and really it's on all of us uh, to, to go get it. So I just really appreciate the all the work that's been put into this point, and I want to make sure you all realize that was a, a, a pretty big deal. Great, thank you, James. Appreciate that. So next we will be moving on to item five under information, 2025 blueprint update on upcoming outreach and engagement activities. AJ? Hi, good afternoon. I'm AJ Tendek, I'm our communications group manager. Uh, Chair, thank you so much for the flexibility in, in shuffling our, our items today. Um, I included a bunch of information um, in the staff item. This is just a uh, update of where we're at in our blueprint outreach. Um, we've got a lot of um, irons in the fire, so to speak. So we just wanted to bring a quick update to all the committees. Um, some upcoming uh, things that I wanted to real quickly highlight is um, we're just under contract for <clears throat> a uh, consultant to help us run some focus groups. We're going to run uh, four groups uh, in Spanish and then another four groups in English. Um, so one, one topic area per uh, focus group. Um, we, we did some uh, public scientific polling with Valley Vision and Sac State that we just got the results back. Um, our staff is doing uh, some analysis on that. 
Uh, we're very intentional on asking questions that have been consistent across even from 20 years ago when we did the first blueprint and then across um, other polling efforts and previous uh, MTPs. Uh, so expect to see that um, in the upcoming months start to come back um, as you're uh, discussing the, uh, the pathway results. Um, very exciting. We, uh, we did a um, $50,000 grant uh, cycle for community-based organizations to help us <clears throat> uh, partner with us to do outreach. Um, so we have 12 groups that we're working with. Um, and those are all under contract and they're starting to do their work to help promote our, um, our outreach efforts right now. Um, I hope you've seen in the executive director's report, James has mentioned we're doing uh, public outreach, uh, hands-on public outreach by visiting um, each of your cities and counties. We're required to do eight of these. We're gonna do our best to do 28 of them and visit you all. Um, so we have been asking for you, for you uh, if you have uh, favorite um, community events in your neighborhoods and in your areas and your cities and counties um, that you think we might go to the spring and summer, we would we would love to go uh, get your feedback on that. Uh, we certainly have staff to, to dive into that and find the fun events, but if you've got some favorites, we'd love to hear it. Um, and then one other uh, big highlight uh, in June, I think that Lynette has been maybe sending out some uh, calendar holds for you is on June 16th, we're going to have a public workshop um, on the uh, blueprint pathways that you all starting to get information on. Um, so that might be a little bit repetitive for you. Um, however, we'd love for you to be there, invite your colleagues. Um, what, we're, what we'd really like to see for an audience there is a few hundred folks, including all of the elected officials across the region, uh, senior staff, our community-based partners, um, and then interested public that are able to do that and really dive into the weeds a little bit on, on some of those scenarios and um, get some good feedback for that as you all uh, then would shortly thereafter start uh, discussing um, preferred pathways. Um, and then one last note, uh, since we know <clears throat> while you all will help us uh, to adopt a successful plan, Really, the implementation of that plan comes down to your actions at your local boards and councils. So we want to engage your colleagues as much as we can. We went out once a few months ago to do a, a tour of the region, um, and we'd like to uh, repeat that as well as do a um, kind of a county sub-level convening in each of the counties um, as we, <clears throat> excuse me, as we develop more um, throughout the, the process. So expect to see those in the future. That's not coming, though, until like fall in the next summer. Um, but wanted to highlight for that for you. So uh, that's my update. Um, I'd love any feedback if you have any um, as we are, are doing our outreach on this. Great, thank you, AJ. Any questions or comments from directors? Okay, I do not see any. Appreciate the update. Okay, thank you. So with that, we will move on to item four 2025 Blueprint Pathways, Land Use Assumptions and Evaluation, Doc. All right, um, good afternoon, committee members. Thank you, Chair. Um, hopefully you can see my screen there. You um, you heard from Clint Holton last, last month at, at this committee, and then um, of course from Alex Steinberger at the board meeting workshop about um, the value of scenario planning and, and what we have ahead of us on the 2025 Blueprint. SACOG has been working over the last year with your staff to develop three pathways to 2050. So this is the first phase um, of a series of presentations to unpack how those pathways perform across uh, a suite of performance metrics using the triple bottom line framework that the board adopted. This is um, gonna be an information packed presentation. Um, I'm gonna pause for questions a couple times throughout, but. Uh, as always, feel free to, to interrupt me at any point um, if you have a question on any particular slide. All right, so in, in 2025, the SACOG board will adopt the blueprint. And at its core, the, the blueprint is gonna include a set of land use assumptions for how we as a region could grow between now and 2050. It's gonna have a set of transportation investments um, that are married to that land use. And then it'll have a set of policies that seek to actually implement that vision. When we talk about the, the land use side of our plan, we're essentially talking about decisions around new housing units and new employment uses. And the key decisions are how much, where, and what kind. So 
uh, how much growth is going to happen regionally, where will that growth occur, and what does that growth actually look like? We discussed some of the considerations um, that go into the, the land use assumptions last August with this committee. Of course, lots of new faces on the committee this year. Um, so just a little recap here. The foundation of those assumptions are your local plans and entitlements. So every four years, we, we catalog what we call a build out inventory to um, really get a good understanding of what's allowed at the local level in your general plans, your specific plans, your zoning, and all of that forms the basis or, or the, the envelope of um, the regional land use scenarios. We did, as I said, a, a pretty comprehensive update to our build out inventory as a part of this plan cycle. Um, a key finding coming out of that analysis is if you were to just add up all of the, the locally planned growth across the region, if you were to sort of staple together all of the general plans, if you will, it's you end up getting a lot more capacity, significantly more than what SACOG's regional growth projections are expecting to happen between now and 2050. So the blueprint land use assumptions cannot include everything that is locally planned. And as a result, we're, we're gonna be making choices around where we invest our, our limited transportation budget. We also build into our assumptions a variety of uh, market factors that really um, seek to ground those assumptions in, in financial feasibility and what actually pencils where. And then critically, we also have a set of policy and performance considerations that we have um, organized as part of this plan under the triple bottom line framework. It's, it's hard to overstate how important these choices around um, where we grow are for these policy goals that we have as part of this plan. Simply put, we're not gonna be able to achieve our objectives without thoughtful and strategic decisions around um, the investments and the policies that influence land use and growth. So in an effort to give the board um, as much information as possible about how the land use and the transportation decisions that we make today affect our future, uh, we have developed these three diverging futures for um, the spatial distribution and the type of growth that the region will experience between now and 2050. You're gonna hear from SACOG staff over the next several months uh, about the performance trade-offs between these three pathways. We're starting this month on land use. It's linked in your staff reports. Um, you can see, but you can see the land use assumptions for each pathway. Uh, it's all live on our website now. The, the landing page that is linked in the staff report includes a comprehensive spreadsheet that you can go through depicting the growth. It's probably how you're used to seeing um, these land use assumptions in the past if you've been on the board for a while. We also now have an interactive map showing the, the geographic areas that are represented by each row in that spreadsheet. And we'd really encourage you to, to take a look at that. We're very proud of it. It allows you to really toggle directly to your jurisdiction. You can see the growth differences by pathway, by plan area, really however you wanna slice them. As part of today's presentation, I'm gonna unpack at a regional level, these key questions of how much, where, and what kind. I'm also gonna explore a bit of what the answers to those questions mean for things like resilience, our agricultural economy, um, people's access to opportunity. So starting first with the first question there of how much, SACOG adopted a regional growth projection back in February of 2022. This projection, it's based on an economic and demographic forecast. It looks at all these trends. And those projections, projections have us growing by about 263,000 new jobs and 278,000 new homes between now and 2050. It's, a, it's about a 30% increase over today. And that growth acts as a, a regional control total, if you will, that will then, we, we sort of hold that growth constant across all three of the pathways. We hold it constant because a lot of the performance metrics that you know, we're gonna be talking about this spring, they're really sensitive to how much growth happens. So it'd be really challenging for, for you as a board and for us to understand what variables are actually driving the performance differences in each pathway if they had different amounts of growth. When we look at on the housing side, what are some of our historic trends on total production? Um, of course, the SACOG region had a building boom in the early aughts in that 2001 to, to 2007 period. We were uh, building over 17,000 units a year at that point. Of course, a lot of that was um, you know, single family expansion on the periphery, but there was a lot of production. All of that growth came crashing down um, in the great financial crisis and then the recession that ensued from 08 to 2015. Uh, we have absolutely started to rebound on overall production in the last five years. We're, um, you know, 
doing about 7,000 units a year in those five years. When you annualize our regional growth projection though for that 2020 to 2050 period, um, you see that we are still sort of assuming a bit of a rebound beyond what we've seen today. So we're a bit short um, in the last five years, we still have some ramping up to do to get to that 9,200 or so units a year that are assumed in our projections. So I'm moving on now to the where or the spatial distribution. Um, this is probably the, the biggest land use question that we will ask as a part of this plan. Many of the performance indicators, the policy goals of the plan are predicated on spatially efficient land use that shrink the distances that people need to travel between their destinations. So for example, dispersive land use, you know, land use that spreads out means that we're building more roads to serve new growth areas, which, which tend to be more auto-oriented, tend to be a bit more spread out, which means more pavement to maintain them over time. So you're gonna hear much more about that particular metric next month, but um, it, it's just an example of many, how many of these metrics that we discuss hinge off the extent to which we are actually expanding our footprint. As this committee knows, we are an incredibly diverse region from a land use perspective. So um, for the last 15 years, we've used a framing tool called community types to uh, divide the region's many development patterns into these categories. So this, this should be fairly familiar for, for veterans on the board here. I'm gonna go through each one just to, to bring up everyone up to speed. Centers and corridors are the first one. They're the core parts of our communities where you see the most compact development patterns. Um, you can think historic downtowns, main streets, um, suburban or urban uh, commercial corridors, our rail um, station areas, our central business districts, all of those are centers and corridors. Then established communities are all the existing communities that are adjacent to centers and corridors. These are places that you, know, you can expect continuing to build out with more kind of suburban residential neighborhoods. Um, you're looking at some non-residential uses, some office, some industrial parks. And then we get to our developing communities, which are more of our, our greenfield or our new growth communities. And this cycle, we are actually splitting out developing communities into uh, developing communities already under construction, which are places that you know, already have at least one home in the ground today. Maybe they've been under construction for a while, but they're not quite at that 50% um, build out mark yet. And then potential developing communities, which are places that we could see growth over the next 30 years, but we don't have any homes in the ground as of today. We then have our rural residential communities, which are you know, outside of urban urbanized areas. A lot of this in sort of the foothills um, uh, for rural residential development locally. And then uh, finally, we have our agricultural and our natural lands, which are um, exactly what they sound like. So here is the, the regional map of our community types. Um, sometimes we talk at the regional level uh, about this term infill development, right? And, and when, when, what we mean by that is any growth that happens in either the red or the, um, uh, the red centers and quarters or the gray established communities. So you can see we have quite a bit of that across the region. Um, looking now here at some of the historic trends for where growth has occurred in our region. And what we see is that job growth typically occurs in centrally located parts of the region. Um, employers uh, usually want to, to maximize access to the regional labor market, right? So for example, this is um, these graphs are for the last four years. We saw about 45% of job growth in those red centers and corridors and only about 12% uh, happening outside of our infill areas. And that's for developing, potential developing rural residential. Housing, on the other hand, has historically been much more dispersive. Um, so, so as you can see here, only about 18% of growth uh, for housing is happening in those centers and corridors in the last four years, close to 30% happening outside of our infill areas. And that housing production is fairly representative of what we've seen in the last 15 years. Um, you can see here the percent of new housing that is um, happening in each of the community types since 2007. Uh, we typically do hover in that sort of 12 to 20% of housing growth in the red centers and corridors. What's interesting though, is that if you look at the far right, um, that far right bar chart, is that you know, this trend is out of sync with where we actually see market feasible capacity in the region. Um, and this is something we did as part of our build out inventory where we look at where we have capacity and where that housing makes 
uh, financial sense to build in the sense that the construction costs are you know being covered by the rents that are um, in that particular area um, or the you know the the ownership costs. Um, thirty eight percent of the units that are market feasible are in centers and corridors, according to this analysis. So you know said another way, despite favorable market conditions and and ample general plan capacity, Centers and quarters are just not living up to their potential as growth engines for our region, at least on the housing side. All right, so here are the three pathways. Um, you can think of them as going from most dispersive on the left to most compact on the right. So pathway one is called outward expansion and limited infill. This is in many ways an extrapolation of some of those historic trends, maybe kind of closer to that early aughts period. The majority of the housing growth is happening via expansion outward in those greenfield developing communities and the rural residential areas. Pathway two is called balanced infill and phased expansion. This pathway explores a future where some of the growth is accommodated via outward expansion, but we balance that growth with robust infill, revitalization of our existing communities. You can think of this one uh, as an attempt to kind of recreate the basic development pattern of our adopted plan. Um, and then pathway three is called infill, uh, focused infill and limited expansion. And this one explores a, um, a future where the vast majority of growth occurs in infill areas with uh, expansion only really occurring in developing communities that are already under construction. So when we, when we built the land use assumptions for the three pathways, the primary question that we are asking is how dispersed is the land use growth gonna be? Um, while you are going to see some job dispersion between the pathways, um, there's significantly less variation on the job side because we have much less control over where firms create jobs. Uh, as part of our regional growth projections, we think a lot about the types of jobs that are going to happen in the future. And one of the things we differentiate between is our economic base jobs, which you can think of as like manufacturing, tech, more white collar services, right? And then our neighborhood serving jobs, which is more of like the grocery stores and, and restaurants. And what we know is that our economic based jobs tend to cluster where there's already lots of stuff nearby. They, they prioritize you know, proximity to other firms, um, access to this regional labor markets, their supply chains. And we call this idea agglomeration. And it's why, it's why the vast majority of our jobs happen in those infill areas. There's, there's much less of that same economic pull towards the core for housing and uh, much more of an opportunity to influence it or, or not with policy and investment. And, and that's why we see the focus of this conversation today on you know, where housing is happening. So here is where the housing growth occurs in each pathway using our community types. And as you can see, there's a pretty large variation in how much of our new housing is happening in those infill red or gray community types between the pathways. So if you, um, if you look at the top here, 42% is in pathway one um, when you combine those two, but it's up to 88% in pathway three. So these are very different visions for what our region will look like. It's important to keep in mind that there is ample market feasible capacity already allowed for in general plans to accommodate any of these growth distributions. What we're talking about here is how that growth is phased with, with pathway three saying that growth between now and 2050 is gonna focus in those infill areas first, pathway one saying that growth will continue to occur in kind of the dispersive way that we've sort of seen in the past. It's uh, really challenging to synthesize these three sets of regional land use patterns in a slide, totally recognize that. I'm gonna do my best to show um, that distribution a few different ways, just so it sort of clicks. Um, this purple outlined gray area that you see here, this represents our existing urban footprint. This is where we already have development on the ground today. And then here is growth in pathway three, pathway two, and then pathway one. And I'm gonna cycle between these slides so you can get a little bit of a sense of how much each pathway expands the region outward. And it's, it's worth highlighting, again, that these are all the same amounts of regional growth. So all the hexes that are outside the, the purple outline in pathway one are being absorbed uh, inside the purple outline in pathway three there. I'm gonna focus now on just a couple key growth areas in our region. First, this is the Southwest part of Placer County. Uh, and again, we have pathway three 
pathway two and pathway one. And you can really see at this scale, you know, the extent to which we are expanding that footprint between the pathways. And then uh, another really key growth area, this is Southeast Sacramento County. Of course, again, you can see the outward growth. Uh, another way to look at these visualizations though, rather than drawing your attention to what's happening outside the purple line is to look at what's happening inside the purple line. So we're really sort of reducing the growth in, in pathway one inside the purple line and increasing it in pathway three. And then another key metric to consider in the spatial distribution of, of growth between the pathways is the proportion of growth occurring in SACOG's green zone. So you just heard from Garrett about the Green Means Go program, right? So this is kind of uh, an extension of that. As you're aware, of course, green, green zones are you know, key growth areas that were locally nominated through the Green Means Go program. And when you look at how much of the growth is happening in green zones, you see the most growth, uh, unsurprisingly, in pathway three, the most infill heavy um, of the pathways, almost half of all units and jobs are happening in green zones in pathway three, and then the least are happening in pathway one with less than 20% of units. So big economic um, prosperity implications for uh, the future of green zones depending upon the pathway. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause here before I get into what kind in case um, folks have, have questions on some of the material so far. Questions from directors. Chair Bradford, I have one. This is Mike Kozlowski. Um, Duff, maybe you could just talk about briefly how it is that you, what the data set is that you're drawing from to drop your honeycomb hexes all over, for instance, El Dorado County. Yeah, so so it's in it, so it's within the envelope of what is allowed and planned. So that's kind of the basis, right? You look again that build out inventory of like looking at all of the local designations from general plans, specific plans, master plans. Um, and so that's that's the envelope. And so we're not, you know, with a couple exceptions, we're not really going beyond um, what is actually already allowed. And then from there, we look at um, some of the market factors. So where is there strong market for growth? Of course, um, this gets interesting, right? Because between the pathways, we're sort of assuming a bit of a different market depending upon the pathway. But but you know, generally speaking, we're we're looking at market factors, and then we're looking at policy factors, right? So you know, again, we're trying to accomplish certain goals as a region through the triple bottom line framework, and so the performance and and policy factors combined with the market factors are helping to sort of shape that. So, if I can just like follow up, then so you've got a discrete parcel somewhere in the county or in Sacramento County, for instance, that is not in what we would consider the that purple boundary, the purple urban boundary, right? And you're suggesting that it has a land use designation that allows for it to be developed, but that depending on how it is that we position ourselves for infill versus um, outside of the boundary growth, you can control the market forces? So, okay, so yeah, that's an interesting question. And actually I think there's, there's two things. Number one, there's some structural market factors that are very difficult for anyone to control, right? So like yeah. labor markets, things like that are very much outside the purview of what local governments can actually control. Right. And then there's some, but there are some market factors that are influenced by, by policy, right? By policy and investment. And so I think that's actually, you know, uh, one of the things that Alex Steinberger mentioned in, in his workshop um, last month was that these pathways are like crash test dummies, right? They're ways of exploring performance impacts and trade-offs of different ways to grow. And, you know, we can use them to develop a vision for how we want the region to look in 2050. And so we can look backwards um, we can then look backwards from there and identify what it would take to actually implement the vision through our you know, transportation investments and our policy decisions. And that is gonna be a big conversation that this board is gonna be having um, later this year and, and in 2024. This first step that we're doing here is about learning. It's about, it's about connecting the dots between land use and transportation with the triple bottom line objectives. So 
Um, that's what we're trying to do this spring with these pathways. We want to better understand if we grow a certain way, what does that mean for the things that we care about as a region? And then again, we're part of the plan will include a whole set of policies. It will also include a set of transportation investments. And that is the piece that we're actually in some ways looking at shaping the market to the extent gotcha. that we can. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and the visualization between the three pathways um, works beautifully for the way my brain operates. So thank you. Sure. Director Frost. Thank you. Um, Dov, I, I had a question relating to uh, the development, the path of development also. Um, the other day I was out at the Deer Creek levee, which was one of the levees that got uh, basically flooded, overtopped. Um, it, the water ripped apart part of the levee and it took out, you know, a very large portion of their their crops there and there's a situation on on that that southeast side of the county that presents a challenge um, and and the three categories that you listed in one of the earlier slides included environment i'm i guess my question is when you say environment do you um does that include safe um safe roads um i'm i'm honestly a little bit pleased to see the you know, i know the growth is coming out that way because we have you know hundreds of rooftops that are scheduled to be st starting soon um but at the same time we have a situation out there on that side of the county whereby these storms, which we're expecting more of, and now given the snowpack of this winter and who knows what happens this spring when that starts melting, um, it, it's a, it's a, it's become a new conversation really around safe egress in the in the event of extreme events. And so my question is, can we elevate that into, our, our coming conversations because we're going to be coming um, to, you know, they're, they're already, we're already having the conversation at, you know, the county and we're going to be having the conversation at the legislative um, and congressional. And uh, we'd like to have that conversation also with SACOG around what can we do to ensure that we're not going to have a situation where all the roads are flooded and there's no way in and no way out in the event of a, a major um, extreme weather event. And so I guess my question to you is, does, does what happened there, and that was a big deal, I, I think it was probably more on Supervisor Hume and Natoli uh, than on, you know, it, on the Murrieta side, although Murrieta side suffered too. It's it's uh, it's very real what happened out there, um, and it can have a, an impact on just on the roads out there. And so, what would be, you know, it, will that conversation be, you know, take a maybe a move up <laughs> to a more important level as we you know start to look at what are some of the solutions that can. Um, be an escape route or, you know, a road out in, in, in that event, you know, it, it could change the way the, the way we may think about um, the connector and it could change the way we think about whether or not we can find a way for funding to fix some of those bridges or roads um, and so forth. I, I, I'm kind of long winded, but it's a little bit emotional because um, even now that the farmers out there are trying to decide, do we replant? Because if we replant and then spring comes, it could wipe out everything that, you know, everything we planted. <laughs> um, it literally wiped out a, a lot. And so I just want to know if we can elevate that into the conversation and if that's going to be the reality or, or will it change the way we're looking at our, um, our plan moving forward. Yeah, it, 
it, it's a fantastic question, Director Frost. So um, actually in a, in a couple, uh, in maybe uh, 15 minutes or so, we're gonna get to this resilience section of which flood risk is absolutely a part of that conversation. So we're gonna talk about fire risk, um, impacts to farmland and flood risk. And you can kind of actually see the extent to which um, we have uh, growth in those high flood risk areas. So the, the conversation today, this is sort of the kickoff, right? This is gonna be a, a multi-month conversation. The conversation today is mostly about sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, unpacking what the growth looks like between the pathways. And you're gonna see how uh, uh, it actually does look in, a, in about 15 minutes. And then perhaps later in the spring, um, based on your comments, we can actually have more of a robust conversation around the these particular concerns about what would happen if you had a lot more growth in these areas, right? So right now it's just like how much growth is in these areas. And then I think we can have a follow-up conversation about what that actually means in terms of emergency response, in terms of some of these other ideas. I don't know if Clint or James want to add anything onto that, but. I think getting to the question of, you know, roads into and out of places affected by potential big flood events like you're talking about, I think that is an important conversation. We do have some, another grant, we're looking at some emergency preparedness around using transit to, to help with some of that. I think we absolutely can get to a conversation about what a resilient transportation network would look like where you do have enough redundancy to to cope with events like that. I think one thing that you'll have to wrestle with is you're thinking about the land use side of it is, um, and Dov, as Dov mentioned, how much exposure do you want to create, right? If you, if you, um, you know, have policies that push, push growth or, or encourage growth outward, you may be exposing more homes, more jobs to some of those flood risks. That's gonna warrant, you know, obviously more roads to serve that. Or is there a way that you can invest in those areas that provide the kind of security, the resilience, the redundancy you need, but doesn't necessarily result in increased exposure, you know, new homes in a, in a regular floodplain. So I think it's it's something that you'll absolutely have to wrestle with. I think Dob will get to some of that on the land use side, but it's something that we'll bring back for sure as we're talking about the transportation investments of your plan. Yeah, just to just wrap it up i mean I, I i don't know if you folks are aware but there was you know like an eight hour period one one full night where people were groping around making turns going back you know groping around in all those little narrow roads trying to figure out how to get out and there were roads closing there were three or four ways out and only one way out to which was toward jackson um that was the only way out at, at, at the whole time and others were closing and opening and it was a mess. It was, it was a situation where um, it, it made us look diff think differently now about that side of the county and what are we gonna do to make sure we have safe roads out, in and out, uh, you know, in the event of an emergency, so. Director Frost, I, I mean, yeah, you're you're obviously hitting on something that's very recent um, <clears throat> from your from your visit there and all the rains and whether it's flood and evacuation or fire, right? And we've talked a lot about the challenges of quick evacuations, especially in more rural communities. Um, it's it, it's a topic we can and should come back to uh, because yeah. the entire region is <laughs> is in a different risk, uh, hazard risk for different kinds of uh, disasters. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. I just wanted it in people's minds, you know, part of the conversation. So, Thank you. Thank you, Director Frost. So, so Dov, I have a, a question as well, and it's kind of following up on what Director uh, Klozowski asked, um, and it may be something that's best answered in coming months. But, you know, when we look at the, the various pathways, and um, I think we can probably imagine that in pathway one, um, you know, where there's a lot more outward expansion and not enough money to build appropriate transportation, um, that we probably aren't gonna like the way that that looks as far as uh, impact on the transportation system in the region. Uh, so, so assuming that is the case, um, and I know we'll get there, and we talked about, 
you know, how, you know, we can say, right, mm, that, that, that's not the direction we want to go. And we can all agree about that potentially as a region. Um, and, and then, you know, each jurisdiction, as you said, could, could even create policies to help shape that uh, if they wanted to. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, the market to some extent kind of decides that, right? So, so if I just want to make sure I'm kind of understanding um, our ability to actually control that future versus our ability to, to not control that future as much, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's the that's the key question, really. Right. And I think we often get to that point um, when we when we do our MTP SES, what we're calling our blueprint this cycle. And I think there is an intention and I'll, I'll let um, again, uh, James and, and Clint chime in here. But I think there's very much an intention this cycle to have um, and part of the extension is, is going to help us accomplish this a much more robust conversation about the policy piece. Right. To what extent can we have a conversation about policies and investments to help shape the market? Um, because what we what we know and 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 you know from all of our work on on housing and land use is that we actually have a little bit more control than than we give ourselves credit for. I think sometimes on the housing piece and on the land use piece, and so there are all kinds of ways. Even though at the general plan level we might sort of allow a certain type of growth to happen, that there are some regulatory barriers that are are within the control. Of, of local regional governments to actually help shape the market. It's, I, I don't mean to sort of um, downplay the challenge. It is a massive challenge to kind of reckon with the market, but I think we wanna have a much more robust conversation this cycle about what we, what we can do to influence it. Okay, thank you. Any additional uh, questions or comments from directors at this point? Oh, James, did you have something? Sorry, we've got the lag here. Um, we're doing the best we can. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just seconding Dobbs' um, response on that. And re remember, we're in some ways we called this plan the blueprint because we want to go back to the reason we did a blueprint. This region voluntarily did a blueprint 20 years ago because the trajectory that we were on, that was more outward growth, it was out of balance, was not good, right? And it's a little bit of what you just suggested, uh, Chair Bradford, in terms of the. Uh, the future. That future looked like a lot of traffic congestion, a lot of air pollution. Um, and our blueprint, if you remember, is not a hard urban growth boundary around the existing urban footprint. It's not. It's actually much harder. <laughs> An urban growth boundary is kind of simple. It's not politically simple, but you draw a line. This blueprint, our blueprint in this region, is about phased growth. If you think about it as a portfolio, it's urban infill, suburban revitalization, and phased greenfield. It's all three, right? But how that happens, when it happens, where it happens is, is key. The market is a huge force, absolutely. And we have and will, again, engage the development community, for-profit and non-profit in this conversation, right? But just as Dob said, too, I think you all give yourselves maybe not enough credit for um, the ability to... Uh, Encourage, green means go, right? Encourage things, remove friction on development, right? Um, um, incentivize certain things, right? Change local policies. So I don't want to over inflate that, but I also don't want to discount it either, right? So, so yes, market demand, consumer demand, demographic shifts, the fee economic feasibility all absolutely plays a role. But you all as local decision makers also have a really big big piece of this. Okay, thank you. Okay, not seeing any additional hands up. I guess you can move on, Doth. Thank you. Great. Okay, so moving now to um, what kind of growth, and we're going to, um, this is actually going to get into some of these market questions and demographic um, trends that James was talking about. We're going to specifically talk about the, the housing product type question here. Um, but I wanted to highlight why housing product type even matters in the first place before we dig in there. And one reason is because household composition in the SACOG region has changed in the last 60 years. In, in 1960, the most common household type was the nuclear family. It, it represented about half of all households. And then adults living alone or adults you know, living with other roommates made up about 23%. Since then, those groups have completely flipped, uh, but our housing stock has not. It, in fact, you know, those trends are actually going to continue in the future. We have 
nuclear families um, by, the, by the end of our plan dropping below 20% in the horizon year in 2050. So we have you know, a mismatch here between what's available and the product types that the region's residents need, want, and uh, maybe most critically can afford. Product type really matters for affordability because smaller lot and attached products they typically have lower price points. Um, they usually have lower per unit land and construction costs that you typically see smaller unit sizes. And this is borne out in, in the average household income in the SACOG region for those that are living in single family homes versus multifamily housing products. Um, we are now at a point in our region where even if you have you know, those six figures to put towards a down payment, the median single family home prices would require the median household to spend more than 30% of their income every month. And you know, that, that means that even middle-class occupations like you know, firefighters, teachers, likely can't afford to buy a large lot single family home. It's just really difficult to achieve affordability through that type of product. And that's why you know, one of the key triple bottom line goal statements for this plan is to identify strategies to address housing affordability by increasing the diversity of housing options. Um, when we talk about product type in the SACOG region, we divide all housing into these, these four different categories here. So attached housing products, it's anything with a shared wall. So anything from a townhome to a triplex to a larger apartment building. You have small lot single family homes. So they're still detached. You're not sharing a wall, but they're, they're on smaller lots. And then large lot single family homes over 50 to 500 square feet, and then rural residential homes on, on one acre lots. And this is showing the splits um, for what the region has actually built in the last 20 years. You can see in that pre-recession period, remember when we were building quite a bit, um, but it's overwhelmingly large lot single family homes, right? And then over time, you've seen that proportion decrease pretty consistently, right? So the green has is, is just decreased each, each time period. The share of attached and small lot single family products has increased. This trend is directly in response to those changing household types and the relative affordability of product types becoming a, real, a bigger and bigger issue in our region. So how do the pathways actually differ in terms of product type? Uh, this is showing how um, housing choice today, which is um, existing conditions there on the far left, uh, and then 2050 conditions in each pathway um, on the three bar charts on the right. So the colors and the percents are showing the end state breakdown in 2050, existing plus new. And then the dotted areas um, that I just popped on the screen there are showing the 2020 to 2050 growth in each category. And as you can see, pathway one sort of doubles down on you know, those single family homes. It actually uh, increases their share, uh, particularly in that small lot category. Um, you see attached housing slightly decreasing. Pathway two includes uh, a lot more attached units um, than large lot single family homes. So you see, um, increases in the 2050 share of attached products from 31% today to 34% in 2050. Pathway two actually most closely resembles the share of each product type that was market feasible in that build out analysis that I keep referencing. And then pathway three pushes it a bit further with the vast majority of growth being attached products. Um, worth noting here that there are over 800,000 market feasible attached units that are already allowed under existing general plans across the region. So even in pathway three, where you, know, you do have a lot of attached units, almost 200,000 of the units are attached, we're only building a quarter of what is both allowed and market feasible. Uh, I think a big takeaway here is that it takes pretty significant variation in the new product types to actually move the needle on the overall mix of housing types in the region in 2050. And that's because there's just so many existing units, right? We, we are gonna be a majority single family home region in 2050, regardless of the growth that occurs. What the pathways do is just provide differing amounts of housing choice for our future residents. And then one more key point just to mention here on product type is that um, the variation in the pathways here is, is very much a reflection of the spatial distribution. The only way to accommodate the same amount of growth with a smaller footprint is to use land more efficiently. So that means you know, more attached and more small lot products. And then on the flip side, uh, the local land use plans that are you know, in our developing communities actually don't allow for much attached housing products. So when, when we have more growth in those areas, areas, 
it's, it's sort of inherently going to be a bit more um, of the large lot single family type of product. Um, I think I'm going to pause there one more time and just see if we have questions on that particular section and then I'll move on and then we'll have one that then we'll then we'll do questions at the end I think. Questions from directors. Okay, I guess uh, I I have one, um, and I and I know it probably comes back to to zoning and to policymakers locally. But um, you know, I, I I look at a lot of the developing communities and potentially developing communities in my jurisdiction, and you know, it's all large lot single family, um, and so. How, how do we move the needle on that? If there is market for other things and more housing diversity and more housing choice, even in developing areas, how how do we get there? Um, and again, I know right a lot of that's zoning and policy, but um, how how can SACOG help with that? I guess is my question. Yeah, well, so I think so. I think you know, there's two pieces, right? There's the the sort of investment piece. Uh, and, and, you know, you just heard from Garrett about Green Means Go and, you know, part of part of sort of this development friction that James is talking about is related to um, the challenges with sort of the non-sexy infrastructure costs in these existing communities that were not um, built, you know, in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s to accommodate denser housing product types, right? And so there is, there is sort of a, a funding issue sometimes with actually uh, right sizing the infrastructure piece to actually accommodate these units. And that's that is a big piece of development friction. And I think just the other part of development friction has to do with um, the local regulatory side. So um, you know, and not just the local, right? It's it, it, there is a state component as well. There's a CEQA side to it. Um, you know, there's sometimes federal permits involved, right? But at the local level, what we have found is that there are hidden barriers within zoning. So things uh, like you know, setbacks, height restrictions, um, things like that. There are development review processy burdens, right? So how difficult is it to get through the approval process to get, um, you know, denser products approved? There's a whole fees components, which is a whole nother, uh, a whole nother animal, right? And that is, has to do with, again, kind of the infrastructure and how do we fund um, services piece. So there's all kinds of these little arenas that actually SACOG has been trying to chip away at and kind of um, talk about holistically over the last, you know, five years since I've been a SACOG and certainly before that, that kind of does really influence that development math. But at the end of the day, I think one thing that I'll just, one last thing that I'll mention on this, and sorry, I'm talking a lot on this, is that I think that um, generally speaking for new growth areas, it's really common for local governments to sort of take a reactive role and sort of let, let sort of the master plan developers come to them and say, here's, here's what I would like. And then it's sort of up, then the sort of local government's like, well, I, I have to decide yes or no, right? And then instead, I think there hasn't been quite as much of the sort of shaping piece and the strategic thinking of like, how do we actually want these communities to look? And I think there is, I think more power, getting back to this theme that James mentioned, more power at, at the local level than we give ourselves credit sometimes to actually shape what that looks like. Thank you. Seeing no hands, I guess, uh, please go on. Okay, so I'm moving now on to resilience here and the rural urban connection. I think this is a topic that is essentially the outcome, again, of the spatial distribution, because as you expand outwards, you're inherently consuming more non-urban land for urban uses. Uh, of course, that has trade-offs for all kinds of things um, across climate resilience and, and our agricultural economy. So you can see here, this is that same existing urban footprint outline where we already you know, have developments and I'll add in, this is um, farmland um, and then I'll add in the 100 year floodplains and now I'll add in the, the high fire risk areas. And as you can see, these areas represent quite a big chunk of the region um, and pose risks um, as we start to think about this outward expansion. So pathway one sees the most risk or the most growth in these high fire risk areas, um, largely due to the rural residential growth that's happening um, in the foothills. So of El Dorado, Placer, Yuba counties. Um, of course, you know, growth in these areas poses disaster risk, some of the same sort of uh, uh, emergency response and evacuation concerns that Director Frost was mentioning on floods are present here. 
Um, there's also an affordability angle here, right? As the insurance rates for housing in these areas have really skyrocketed in recent years. So you're starting to see it, it'd be a lot more expensive to actually afford housing out here. Pathway one um, also sees the most growth in our highly valuable farmland. Um, this is all based off of the, the farmland mapping and monitoring program data. Um, as I know, this committee is, is particularly aware the, the food and agricultural economy of the SACOG region is one of our key economic engines. It's valued at $12 billion, over 7,200 farms, 2 billion in farm gate uh, output. Um, so converting farmland into urban uses on the periphery does pose risks um, to, to that economic activity. Um, and then you can see a similar trend here on the flood risk areas. So the most acres of growth um, in these flood risk areas are in pathway one and then the least in pathway three. Um, of course, top of mind after the flooding that this region experienced in the last storm um, and sort of getting, getting to that point, uh, Director Frost. And I, I think that, you know, Clint's point is, is right on that it's about sort of exposure, right? So as we talk about, you know, there's gonna be flood risk in parts of the region, regardless of how we grow. And it's sort of a question of in, in each of the pathways, how much exposure to that risk do we have? How many people are living in these areas, right? Okay, and then finally, we have also analyzed the pathways in terms of improving people's access to opportunity. And this is a big concept that we're gonna be building into this plan update. Our triple bottom line objective explicitly talks about identifying strategies to, to increase the diversity of housing options that are available in areas with good access to quality jobs, to good access to schools, outdoor space with lower exposure to, to harmful pollutants. And, and this is essentially what access to opportunity is about. We wanna open up these high opportunity areas to all economic segments of the community. High opportunity areas, you can think of these as neighborhoods that really maximize the chances of life success if you grow up uh, in them. Uh, almost two years ago now, we had um, Stephen Menendian come out and talk about this very topic. Um, the state actually produces opportunity maps every year now that divide the whole state's census tracks up by how high opportunity they are based on some of those metrics I just mentioned across you know, educational, economic, and environmental realms. And when you look at these areas, these high opportunity areas in the SACOG region, they're overwhelmingly made up of single family homes, right? In fact, 75% of existing units, 90% of residential land, and 97% of residential parcels in SACOG's high opportunity census tracts are single family. Those households that can't afford a down payment on single family homes experience a financial barrier to actually accessing and living in these high opportunity neighborhoods. We know there's, a, there's an income and a wealth gap between white and non-white households. Um, so if the places that best improve social mobility are disproportionately out of reach for non-white households, the, the product types uh, in these neighborhoods are actually reinforcing racial disparities. So increasing the number of you know, more affordable housing types, attainable housing types in these high opportunities is, is a strategy to alleviate these, these racial and economic disparities. And we measure that here as part of the triple bottom line assessment. Uh, we talked earlier about you know, which housing products tend to be more affordable than the large lot single family homes. So you know, we're measuring here, increasing access to opportunity, um, looking at how many new small lot or attached units are happening in high opportunity areas across the pathways. These are new units. And what we find is that pathway one has a lot of overall growth in these high opportunity areas, but not much of it is, is very affordable. It's more of that large lot product. Meanwhile, pathway three has over 15,000 more of these more attainable units than pathway one. And that, that creates more access to opportunity for households with, with more modest incomes. All right, I appreciate everybody sticking with me. I know that was a, a ton of information. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna be coming back to this committee every month um, through June to talk about the pathways and all the other um, performance indicators that we're using to evaluate the trade-offs of these really diverging ways to grow. Um, thanks, thanks for your time. Happy to answer any, any questions that you might have. Great, thanks, Doc. Any more questions or comments? Yes. Harris. Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, figure out the raise my hand button on this thing. But anyway, 
I wanted to just piggyback and, and reaffirm what Dov mentioned previous, previously about local jurisdictions um, not kind of being more reactive, waiting for um, developers to come to them with a plan as, as kind of one of the uh, ways to get around the uh, problem of, you know, it's just single family homes and that, and that's it. And the example is we went out to Salt Lake City recently and we admired uh, many communities out there that were quite successful, quite vibrant and been, being very successful. And one of the takeaways that they gave us was for the local jurisdictions, the councils, the boards and whatnot to deliberately decide, okay, this is where we want to go. This is what we want to be and have the developers come to them to fit their plan, not the other way around. And it was one of the major takeaways, and that's exactly what uh, Dov alluded to, I think, unless I misunderstood, that's what he was talking about. And so that's just an example of that being um, something for all of us to consider as we move forward and develop our plans and, and we consider new developments and things coming to our areas is we, we decide, plan ahead now, um, before they put a stick in the ground, what we want it to look like. A lot of these issues, we, and we want walkability and, and accessibility and whatnot, but right here in Yuba City, the house where I'm sitting right here right now, I can't get to a bus stop. And so you have to drive to the walkability. But if we put, think about it on the front end, um, it, it'll, it'll, you know, future generations, it will be, will probably be very grateful for us. So my thoughts on that. So thanks, Doug. Great. Thanks for those thoughts. Any other thoughts? Okay. Thanks, Dov. I, uh, I appreciate this discussion and I appreciate all the information you provided and uh, look forward to more of it over the coming months. So, okay. With nothing else on that, we will move on to item six, reports from committee members. Anything from any committee members? Okay, well, I'll, I'll just quickly uh, um, thank James for coming up to Yuba County this morning and presenting at uh, the South Yuba Sunrise Rotary. Uh, the topic was actually uh, SACOG and even was able to kind of do a little outreach about the blueprint too. So uh, kind of a two for one there. And I think it went really well. And so I appreciate that. And I also wanted to thank uh, Director Baines for um, chairing the last meeting. Um, I, I have a question. Um, I can't find the um, raise my hand button on here either. So I'm not sure what, but um, what kind of things are you looking for in these reports? I, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure what um, yeah, I, I think it could more, be anything. I want to be more prepared, but I'm I'm not sure if you're just looking for information about housing projects that are happening or or I, I just it actually like can be in anything from your jurisdiction that you want to share with the rest of the group that you think it would be beneficial for us all to know about. So it doesn't have to be housing. It it could be uh, you know a great um, yeah. festival that's coming up or an event that you want to invite us to or. Really, it's just an opportunity to kind of have some discussion about our various jurisdictions and what's going on, uh, even if it's a little um, not quite as relevant directly to SACOG. It's it's perfectly fine to share during this time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. you're welcome. Okay, we have some receive and file items. And I think that is it. Is there anything else, James? Yeah, Chair Rapper, if I, if I could, I, I hope everybody uh, gets the executive director update every other week. Uh, I myself was surprised to see my mug on the top of that yesterday, so don't don't be don't be offended. Don't 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 click delete. Um, but a few things in there. I just want to reemphasize. Um, we partnered with the Urban Land Institute and a lot of other folks, but ULI, which is a great organization, and they you're going to hear more from some of the work that they've been doing on uh, the North Walk Corridor, Folsom and Yuba City and Marysville um, in the months ahead. But on March 23rd, uh, they're gonna be doing a, um, uh, a, an event, a forum on transitional housing to tackle homelessness. And uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with ULI, this being the Land Use and Natural Resources Committee, I definitely highly, highly recommend them. Uh, but it'll be March 23rd, 8 to 10.30 a.m. 
Um, it'll be in person. They're also holding 40 spots for elected officials. Um, so I really, um, uh, if you look at my executive director update, you can click on the link there and send an email. And so they're holding spots for elected officials. We really recommend, I know there's lots of events and forums on homelessness and because everybody is facing the challenge, but um, highly recommend that one. And then um, again, just per my, my update, uh, we talked a lot about today, the blueprint, and it was referenced several times. Uh, we wanna try to take some more time, both because everything that you just heard of today and through Dobbs presentation is gonna take quite a bit this year, right? To work through and have a big regional dialogue we want to extend the timeline of our plan to 2025. We need state legislation. And uh, that comes in the form of Assembly Bill 350, um, authored by Assembly Member Aguirre Curry, it is good for its first hearing in Assembly Transportation on March 13th. Thank you to those of you that have had your jurisdictions offer letters of support. It is really critical that we get that state blessing on an extended timeline because of our sustainable community strategy goes into laps, we become less competitive for state transportation funds. So we don't want to lose that com competitive edge. Um, so that's that's my other matters. Okay, Clint or any other staff? I think that's everything from us. Okay, so with that, uh, I guess we will adjourn and our next meeting will be on Thursday, April 6th at 1.30. So thank you, everyone. We'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Gary. Bye-bye.